Again, if you're joining us for the first time, I always assume we have guests, and uh, it's not our practice to make you stand up and, and embarrass you, but we do welcome you, and we're glad you're here. And we're on a journey through the Gospel of Luke. Uh, we've been on it for some time. We're in the 11th chapter, and in this series on, on the Lord's Prayer, uh, this is week three. In week one, I dealt with the fact that the prayer we just read in Luke sounds pretty different from the prayer we said in worship and the prayer that we know most common from the Gospel of Matthew and why there's differences in the New Testament about this and so on. That was dealt with in the first sermon of this series, and I invite you to go to our website. You can watch or download those sermons and read them uh, to get caught up, as well as last week. Last week, we devoted our attention to the first word of the Lord's Prayer, which is Father. And uh, remember that the use of this familiar, familial term was completely unprecedented uh, in the ancient world, and even within the Old Testament. The Old Testament has a few uh, references within Exodus, Isaiah, and Hosea of God uh, as Father, envisioned as God and Father, and the people of God as, as the son of God, sons of God. But uh, the word and association used in the Old Testament is not the same as the word and association in the New Testament. When Jesus says, when you pray, say, Father, the Aramaic word that he would have used is Abba, been Papa, Daddy, and it was a very intimate, familiar term used within the households of the ancient world. So that, that was a very new and novel concept. Christ invites his disciples to approach God in prayer with this deeply affectionate, intimate title. But remember, as we looked at last week, that not everyone within the biblical worldview is to be called or associated with the children of God. And this is very offensive to our ears, and, and I always recognize that when I say something like that, you're like, oh, I don't think I agree with that. All I'm trying to help you to understand is here's the biblical worldview, and that is that Jesus in John 8 and in Matthew 13 clearly demonstrated and said and taught that not everyone should be considered a child of God. Some, there are children of God, and then there are children of the enemy, children of the devil is what he says. And that uh, was a difficult thing for us to hear and to work through last week. And I have to come back to that for just a minute because it, it bears coming back to. As I was searching through the New Testament again and just reading this week, I came upon another treatment of this, and you'll find it all throughout the Bible. But in 1 John 3, verses 1 through 10, we're going to just look at this one more time, and it'll point to where we're going. Listen to what John says. He says, How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. Of course, he's writing to believers, writing to the early church. And there's that reference again. We should be called children of God. And that is what we are, he says. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God. And what we will be has not yet been made known, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him and the Lord purifies himself just as the Lord is pure. Verse 7, dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. He who does what is right is righteous, just as the Lord is righteous. He who does what is sinful is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in him. He cannot go on sinning because he's been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God, nor is anyone who does not love his brother. So once again, we see the world you know, boiled down into two groups of people, the children of God and the children of devil. And uh, John makes it clear that there must be this reality of the devil's work being broken. And as we find in John 3, when Jesus is teaching Nicodemus, he says, you must be born again. So the concept is that our natural birth leads us to be in the wrong camp. Our natural birth, being sinners and, and sin, you know, slaves to the sinful nature, leads us into this place. And through the intervention of Christ, you know, breaking the bonds of, of the work of the enemy, we are delivered into, adopted into the family of God that we might be considered children of God. And it's the very power of God in us that empowers us to have a change and transform life. These people who, by the blood of Christ, have been saved and redeemed, filled with the Holy Spirit, are children of God. They're invited to pray, saying, Father, Papa, Daddy, this very intimate relationship. Those who have not been born of God through the intervention of the Son remains, you know, slaves to the sinful nature, and they worship and serve the enemy. This is what it said. And the only way we can discern which camp we're in is to look at the fruit of our lives. 
If the fruit is that we are increasingly becoming a subject to the lordship of Jesus Christ and obedient to what he's commanding us, and we are increasingly loving our neighbor as ourselves and loving our brother, then we are, that confirms that we are adopted into the household of God and we are children. We pray, Papa. But if we fail to obey his commands, even if we say, I believe in God, but we, we, there's no sign of obedience in our lives and, and, and we do not love our brothers, John says, you know, in, in chapter 2, verse 3, that we're liars and the truth is not in us. So here at the very outset of this prayer, Jesus teaches his disciples, we have this gut check when we come to this prayer. We have to stop when we get to the very first word and ask ourselves, am I a disciple of Jesus Christ? Have we been born again through the forgiveness of sins and the indwelling of his Holy Spirit? Do our lives reflect an ever-increasing obedience to the Lordship of Christ in the way we live and the way we love? If so, then we can be confident that we have been adopted as children of God and we pray St. Papa. If we're not followers of Christ, as evidenced by the lack of obedience and the lack of love in our lives, let us not be liars and deceivers, especially to ourselves. We must not claim to be children of God. Rather, we would do well to seriously consider who actually is our Father. According to several references we've seen now in the Gospels and in the Epistles, According to the biblical worldview, there are only two conditions within all of the human race. Those who are sons of God and those who are sons of the enemy. And because we're all guilty of sin, we all become slaves to sin, according to John 8, when Jesus told us last week that everyone who sins becomes a slave to sin, then you know, that would have put us, if we, if we haven't been adopted into God's family, then it puts us in this other camp as, as children of the devil. Now, let me tell you something. If you're here this morning, you're not a follower of Christ, but somehow you ended up in church, I suspect you have never thought of yourself as a son or daughter of the devil. Nobody wants to think of themselves in that way. And I think that's probably very offensive to any number of people, and I just want you to know it'd be very offensive to me, and I get that. But what I want you to know is you're in good company, right? Because none of us are born into a sinless condition. And, and we all know that. We all know that, that we have sinned, that we've, we've done things that we can't undo, that we've said and hurt people. And so, you know, we understand that sense of condemnation within ourselves. None of us are born of God in a natural state. We must be adopted into the family of God through the atoning work of Christ on the cross, the indwelling of his Holy Spirit that comes about when we repent and we call upon the name of Christ and receive baptism for the forgiveness of sins. That's what Paul, Peter told us in, in Acts 2 last week. Apart from Christ, knowingly or not, by default, this is what the worldview is, by default, we serve a Lord that does not love us, that will not forgive us, whose evil agenda will become evident within our lives and our inability or our unwillingness to love others. Now, I know that sounds harsh and maybe even simplistic, but that is clearly the unified witness of the Old and New Testament. Now, Christianity is often mocked by atheists, materialists, and those who think of themselves as highly sophisticated in their thinking. They accuse Christianity of being overly simplistic and entirely too narrow. And you'll hear these things in the marketplace within you know, our, our colleges and, and academic institutions. They'll say things like, after all, don't we all know good people who are not Christ followers? Are we really to think that they are all children of the devil? What about all these other world religions? Are they simply wrong? Are they all going to hell? Surely there must be other groups of people who are not Christians yet are acceptable to God by virtue of their kindness and their, their love and charity towards others. I mean, isn't it a bit harsh to say that we're all born into sin? Isn't it more likely that we're all born morally neutral and that it is up to us to decide upon what kind of person we will become? Isn't it likely that most people are acceptable to God if they have been decent human beings who tried their best to be kind and generous to others? Is this God of the Christian life even worth considering if he's not going to lighten up a bit? I mean, after all, aren't we all God's children? These are many of the, the, the responses you'll hear to the, the biblical worldview. And then, of course, science kind of weighs in, and most of your modern-day atheists kind of rest their case on this fact that you know they feel that science has proved that None of this religious moralism is even valid since we all evolved from fish over billions of years. And then you have the larger kind of postmodern American mindset that is, who knows? Life is what it is, 
Enjoy it while you can. Pleasure yourself and take care of your own because when it's done, it's done. Now, the mere complexity and variety of worldviews, along with our cultural preoccupation with being nice and inclusive of everybody's opinion, regardless of the obvious fact that they cannot all be true, this has made the biblical worldview increasingly offensive to our current culture. And what's worse, I think what's made it worse, is that many preachers and theologians or scholars in seminary have attempted to synthesize competing worldviews with the biblical worldview so as not to you know, offend our critics. The consequence of their muddled influence is that very few people, even in the church, have a very clear picture of the biblical worldview as it is actually presented in God's word. Now, I've spent over 25 years being a student of worldviews, and here's what I will tell you from my own findings and, and my, obviously, my perspective, and that is that the biblical worldview as presented in the Old New Testaments is the only worldview that actually makes sense of what we see and how we are. I mean, if you just started with yourself and what you can see and what you know about your own tendencies as a human being, the biblical worldview is the only one that actually makes sense of that. Now, you may agree or disagree with that, but my challenge to you as the church, as those who are believers this morning, is to both understand and accept the biblical worldview to be exactly what Jesus said and what the apostles have written. And this is the biblical worldview. There are only two kinds of people in the world, those who are saved and those who are not. There is only one triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and there's only one way to the Father. There's only one means by which we can be forgiven and receive eternal life, and that is Jesus Christ, his blood shed on the cross that covers our sins when we repent and call upon his name. And we do have an enemy who hates us and lies to us and tempts us to worship anything and anyone other than God the Father. There is a heaven and there is a hell, and we will go on for eternity in one of those two places. Good people do not go to heaven. Forgiven people go to heaven. And there is a fellowship of believers called the church, the bride of Christ, whose mission it is to make disciples of Christ and to love like Jesus loved. Now, we have no reason to be embarrassed or ashamed by the simplicity and clarity of the biblical worldview. Trust me when I tell you that the competing worldviews that are out there have far more problems you know, dealing with the questions that I just asked uh, than, than the biblical worldview. And they're not the least bit satisfying. I, I will stake my life and my eternity on the single human life that influenced every aspect of our culture today because he is the only life that was publicly executed and on the third day rose again and was seen by hundreds, if not thousands, who went to their death willingly simply to say, he's not dead, he's alive. He is risen. I will stake my life and my eternity on the single human life who is the basis of our calendar, whose profound wisdom is the subject of more pages written about you know, than any other subject ever, whose love was so compelling that it has inspired more songs, more poems, more structures, more hospitals, more acts of compassion and kindness than any other person's influence ever. I will stake my life and my eternity on the only name that has a long history of healing the sick, casting out demons, and raising the dead. His name is Jesus Christ, and I will submit my mind and my worldview to his mind and his worldview, and I invite you to do the same because this is what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And disciples are invited to pray, saying, Papa, Father, Daddy, hallowed be thy name. Now, what in the world does the word Hollywood be? I mean, we don't use that word very often, right? The English word Hollywood comes from the Greek verb agiazo, which means set apart as sacred to God, make holy, consecrate, regard as sacred, purify, and cleanse. The verb used in Luke 11, here's your Greek lesson for the day, is in the imperative aorist passive, which means to be, but it's an order to be, be set apart uh, once and for all. It's not a let this happen every day. It's let it happen and let it happen decisively once and for all. Be consecrated once and for all in some unchanging final way. And, and this is the whole sense of, of this word, hallowed. The question that comes here is, who will be responsible for the name of God being set apart as sacred once and for all or being made holy or consecrated in a way that is final and unchanging? Who's going to make that happen? When we say, hallowed be thy name, who are we talking to and who's responsible for, for that happening? I mean, are we saying, uh, I generally wish that your name will find its way to becoming holy someday? 
Are we saying we're hoping that the world will come to honor the name of God as sacred and holy? Are we praying that the name of God would become sacred and holy in our own lives? Or are we praying that God, God himself, will take action to make his name sacred and holy? Sometimes we say these words, we're not really sure what it is that we're saying when we repeat them, hallowed be thy name. I think the best example, one of many, uh, would be Psalm 111. And I just want to read this to you. Here's just a wonderful psalm. You can read this, read along on the screen there. Praise the Lord. I will extol the Lord with all my heart in the counsel of the upright and in the assembly. Great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. Glorious and majestic are his deeds, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works, giving them the lands of other nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are steadfast forever and ever, done in faithfulness and uprightness. He provides redemption for his people. He ordained his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. This is a wonderful example of what it means when we say, Hallowed be thy name. The psalmist is showing us that God is not just the God of many other competing deities. This is the very specific God. God is the God who proved his character through his works, through his justice and righteousness, through the wonders recorded throughout history. He's proven himself, his nature, by his name, to be gracious and compassionate, to be a provider for those in need. He's shown himself to be powerful, faithful, trustworthy, loving, and steadfast. And most importantly, he has provided redemption for his people through an eternal covenant that he chose freely to ordain. So God is responsible for setting apart his name. For his name to be hallowed, God is responsible for that. And he has accomplished everything that would require his name to be consecrated and sacred and set apart. And that's what the psalmist is affirming in the psalm. He says, your name is awesome and holy and great because of all that you've done, you've proved yourself to be set apart. Another great example of making a name hallowed is in Philippians 2.9. This is a very famous New Testament passage. Paul writes, Therefore God exalted him, Christ, to the highest place and gave him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee would bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I love, you know, the deference of the Trinity. They always defer to one another in, in mutual love. And uh, here you have, <laughs> you know, Jesus teaching us to, to say, how would be thy name to the Father? And then the Father comes right along and says, but Jesus, how would be you? I give you a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee would bow and every tongue confess that Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. So this is what it means to set apart a name as holy. That's what the language means. Now, when we pray this as believers, what are we saying and what are we doing? I'm going to say we're, we're doing just a few things. Next, uh, first, we are once again identifying who it is that we're praying to. When you say, Father, how would be thy name? This is all part of the address of who you're talking to. You're not talking to some random cosmic deity who set the world in motion and stepped away. We're praying to Father who is proven throughout history, proven in our own lives, that proven in every conceivable way that he is holy and set apart from all others. In the ancient world, a person's name was synonymous with their character and their person. So when we pray, how would be thy name? We're literally saying, Father, your name, your identity, your character, everything about you is set apart from every other name because you are holy and you've proven yourself to be so. You are sacred your name is unique and unmatched by any other name. Your name, your reputation, your rightful title of king is both earned and unparalleled. And so when we pray, we say, Father, hallowed be thy name, it's this two-part reality of identity. It is Father, Papa, Daddy, this intimacy, and then it's you are the king of glory. You are the Lord of lords. You are above every other name. Isn't that cool? It's both. It's very intimate and it's very reverent. At the same time, we're, and this gives us a clear sense of the address of who we're dialing up when we pray. We're not praying to some general deity. We're praying to the Father, who is both Abba, Daddy, Papa, and the King of glory. Next, when we pray, hallowed be thy name, we're choosing to hallow no other name, especially our own. 
The prayer Jesus teaches us to pray immediately establishes the correct order of things. God is God. We are not. God is God. Our job is not. God is God. Our family is not. God is God. Our money is not. The Father is clearly set apart as the master, the king, the one in charge, and we find ourselves immediately in a posture of humility and dependence. You know, so much sin comes about in our lives when we just forget <laughs> who's in charge. We forget who made us and who saved us. We forget who gave us breath and who supplies our needs. We forget the one who has earned the rightful place to be the Lord of our lives. The prayer Jesus taught us to pray reminds us of that correct order. It immediately puts us in the place of, of being inferior to our superior. And many times, that's all we need to see our sin and repent and kind of get back on track as, as followers of Christ. Next, when we pray, hallowed be thy name, we are also inviting God to prove himself again this day. And it's not prove himself in a way that says, you know, every day you got to do something or I'm not going to believe in you. It's, that, that's not what we're saying. We're inviting God to be himself in us and through us in this world. We're, we're inviting him to, to show himself to be who he is and how he is. Why? So that his name would receive glory. And this is a huge point. Sounds church language, but it's not. Let me explain it. You know, all throughout the Bible, we hear over and over again that God deserves all the honor, glory, and praise. We, I mean, you can find thousands of verses that talk about this. And it's because God alone is worthy of all of these things, and we are not. So when we pray, hallowed be thy name, we're inviting the Father to receive all the glory that is rightfully his, and we're inviting ourselves to receive none. We are inviting God to receive all the praise instead of attributing praise to good luck or good genes or a nice turn in the market. We are confessing that if all goes well today, if all goes according to the kingdom agenda, then God's name will be set apart and his character would shine through no matter what, and no other name will share that glory. He'll get all of it. Now, why is that such a big deal? Well, it's pretty clear, isn't it? I mean, we can't handle glory, honor, and praise. None of us can. I mean, if we receive glory, honor, and praise, we'll inevitably become obnoxious, conceited, proud, or indulgent. And the enemy loves to tempt us with this appetite for praise. In fact, many of us hunger for praise so desperately that, that we kind of act like fools or we, we, we try to achieve our way into a place where people will notice us and they'll give us praise. When, in fact, the gospel teaches us that praise doesn't belong to you. And if you get that praise, it'll corrupt you. It'll turn your heart away from the Lord. But even worse than that, people might be distracted by you. <laughs> people might be distracted by me. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, you see, when God is glorified and his name is Hollywood instead of ours, then the world sees God, they admire God, and they're drawn to worship God. Now, how terrible might it be if I receive praise or glory and honor or you receive praise and glory and honor, and some poor fool might be tempted to worship you. That would be bad. All would be lost, right? Why? Well, because we can't save souls. God can. We can't heal what's broken in people, but God can. We can't transform a human heart. God can. So God needs us to receive all the glory on our praise so that the world will see God and be saved. They don't need to see us because we can't save them. You understand? Now, as we look towards next week, we'll move to the next line, which naturally follows the celebration of God's name and identifying who it is that we're praying to, and that is a submission to his agenda. Thy kingdom come. And I look forward to being with you next week to, to bring that message. But I want to close this morning uh, coming back to what I, I know is generally offensive. And here's why. It's because, you know, you're a wonderful church. But I know that every week we have people, maybe no offense to the people in the back, but either in the back or the balcony, people who kind of snuck in to check out this Christian message, to maybe consider the claims of the, of the gospel. And when you hear things like this about the biblical worldview, it can be very offensive. And most of the times I don't get to hear from you. But I'm very compassionate to that because it was very offensive to me for a long time. And so I want, to, I want to challenge all of us as the church, but especially you who probably are, are critics and, and on the fence about the Christian faith. I just want to challenge you to consider something. I just want you to consider this one question. What if this is all true? What if we are actually sons of God or sons of the devil? I mean, just consider the possibility. What if that's true? 
What if we are either forgiven, saved, and adopted into God's family, or we are slaves to sin, unforgiven, and condemned to an eternity without God's presence? What if that is actually the way it is for you, for me, and for every person on this earth over the age of 12? I mean, let's assume for a minute that the biblical worldview, as we've seen here in the New Testament, is actually accurate and true. Just assume that's potentially true for a minute. What would that actually mean to you? I mean, how would that change your life? How would that change the way that you prioritize your time, your money, and your energy? How would that affect the way you think about and treat other people? How would that affect the way that you pray? How would that change the way you perceive this life and the life to come? Assuming the biblical worldview is true, and we actually do have an enemy who lies to us, who has been a liar, who's the father of lies, who's been sinning from the beginning, according to the Bible, what do you think would be the nature of that enemy? What do you think this enemy would lie to us about? Do you think the enemy of God would be working towards providing clarity for the way things actually are? Or do you think it's likely that the enemy of God would work towards creating confusion about the way things actually are? Do you think the enemy would be pleased with the general cultural drift or displeased? Do you think the enemy of God would honor the boundaries of God's truth? Or do you think he would attempt to stretch those boundaries so that the truth is not clear? Now let me tell you my story. For many years as a student of the Bible and a budding theologian, I was like so many of my peers in that I assumed the Bible was helpful and informative, but probably not authoritative. I was led to believe and I was taught that the Bible could be trusted to help us to understand Jesus, the man who died on the cross and rose again, but I wasn't sure that we could trust the Bible to be clear about how things actually are. In other words, a very clear biblical worldview. I was more or less convinced that the biblical worldview was, was likely incomplete or less than accurate due to ancient ignorance of science, technology, archaeology, and so on. Now that presupposition that I brought to the Bible, that I brought to the conversation, led me to a very murky, unclear, ever-shifting perception of reality. Like many people who thought of themselves as being scholarly and academically and in and intellectually respectable, I came to the conclusion that's held by many in my generation and, and younger that truth cannot actually be known. The only thing I know is that I don't know and that nobody will actually ever know what is actually true. And I had a lot of company. I had many friends who agreed with this kind of conclusion and, and found a culture that was very receptive to that kind of humility about not knowing anything that nothing could be actually known. But I will tell you that while that murky, muddled worldview was comforting and I had a lot of company, it was chronically unsatisfying because it did not account for what I could see and observe in myself and the world around me. And if you're honest with yourself this morning, you hold on to that kind of worldview, you, I think we'd all, if we were honest, have to admit that's deeply unsatisfying. It does not account for what we see and what we know in our own daily existence every day. Then one day, I asked myself the same questions that I just asked you. I actually felt like someone with a capital S asked me those questions and demanded that I answer. It was then that I realized that I had never actually given the full, complete, uncomfortable biblical worldview an opportunity to be true. I fancied myself an intellectual, but I had been intellectually irresponsible because I had assumed from the outset that it probably was not true and it was not complete. I had not given it a fair valuation. When I began then to study what the Bible actually says about the way things actually are, I was amazed that I discovered that it was the most intellectually satisfying worldview I had ever considered, starting with me, starting with what I could see and observe in myself and the world around me. And then it hit me. Wow. If this is all true, and it appears that it may very well be the case, well, then that changes everything. God's word can be trusted. People need the Lord. Jesus is the only way. I'm in a battle with an enemy I can't see who constantly lies to me, and that actually makes sense of what I experience often in my life. But I am deeply loved by God and forgiven by Christ. I've been given power and authority through the Spirit of God living in me. 
When I die, I will be in paradise, but I have many friends and members of my family who will not be with me unless they repent and call upon the name of Jesus. It would be unloving not to tell them. What if it's all true? What if it's just as Jesus said? Have you given that a fair shot? I would encourage you to do so. Because I believe it is true that we really can be forgiven and we really can call upon God and call him Papa, Father, Daddy. How would be your name? Thy kingdom come. Will you pray with me? Father, it is a great pride and maybe a touch of arrogance that we would stand as creatures who live a very short life and then return to the dust to shake our fist at the God of the cosmos and say, because I don't understand it and it doesn't feel right, it can't possibly be true. So I pray for the humility that comes with seeing the brokenness in our own lives and the sinful brokenness of the people around us to say, perhaps there has been one who has spoken and made this all clear. Why we are the way we are, how we are the way we are, and how we might have hope to not always be the way we are, to be something more like perfect, more like beautiful, more like what surely must have been intended. And I, I thank you that you took on our skin and learned our language in the very person of Jesus Christ to come and show us how it actually is, how the world actually is parsed out and, and what it means to be a, a child of God, what it means to be one who is a slave to sin and then set free through the sacrificial blood of the perfect life that we might be adopted into your family, that we might be, have such an intimacy with the God who created us that we call you Papa. I thank you for the power of your revealed word that is true, that helps us to understand what is true and deeply satisfies our intellect to understand how we are and what we see, but gives us hope, it gives us hope for the future, it gives us hope that a new day is coming and there is one who has saved us and who will come again and bring us home. Lord, this is our faith. This is our prayer. In the name of Christ, amen.